Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to worship at Uniting Church Sketty, whether you are here in person and it's good to see so many people, or whether you are at home on Zoom, you are all most welcome. You should have received some notices. Please read them. Please take them home with you for reference um, so that you're up to date with everything that's going on. And now, if you're able to do so, will you stand as the Bible is brought in? And this morning, our worship is led by our minister, the Reverend Leslie Noon. Morning, everyone. Morning. Come and listen for the word of God in fellowship and faith, in spoken word and silent thought, in scripture and in song. And so we raise our hearts and voices to God in song, for God's people have always been singing number 21. Let's pray. Our church, 
we call this place. But we are wrong. The church belongs to God, who loved it into existence, watched over it from the beginning, and is already forming the future. And yet, because of all we give, of love and loyalty, faith and work, time, money and prayers, is it not also ours, this church? Not so. These also are God's gifts to us. And so, God of the past, we give thanks for yesterday and for all that has led us to this place. And God of the present, we give thanks for today and all that we share together. And God of the future, we place into your hands all our tomorrows and the tomorrows of this church, trusting that you will be faithful to us and we will be faithful to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On this, my final UCS service, I want to share with you something that is critical to me on my faith journey, which I guess underpins all that I have sought to preach, to teach and to live. And I also thought for a more light-hearted touch that I would share with you two other things that are also important in my life. I suppose, I hope you will remember these three things when I am gone. And the three things are the Bible, dogs, and chocolate. Now, you might think that those three things bear little or no relation to each other, but I hope that I will be able to demonstrate that in my theology, they do. I hope I will be able to show how God speaks to us through the Bible, but also through dogs and chocolate. And so in connection with this, the reading that I have chosen is one which is pivotal for me. It sums up in a few beautiful words what I think my faith means, what my faith is about. It's one of my guiding texts. We're going to hear it now from John's first letter, written not so much for a, a particular specific audience, but for a more general one, which I guess includes us today. And I've asked Jeff, who supports me incredibly in my ministry, if he would read it for us. The reading is from the first letter of John, chapter 4 verses 7 to 21 and you can find it on page 1227 right at the end of the pew bibles god's love and ours dear friends let us love one another for love comes from god everyone who loves has been born of god and knows god Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, 
Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. <clears throat> there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made imperfect, not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet, yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen <clears throat> cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Amen. <clears throat> it might seem obvious to want to share with you my thoughts on the Bible, at least more obvious than preaching on dogs and chocolate, or, or maybe not, as you know me so well. We read from the Bible every Sunday, and hopefully we read it for ourselves during the week. Why? Because we take scripture seriously. As a minister, I am under the authority of scripture. As Christians, you are under the authority of scripture. But what does scriptural authority mean? What does it look like? John Wesley said, I am a man of one book. What did he mean? Well, I think he meant that scripture takes precedence over everything else. And that's fair enough. But why then do Christians disagree on so many important and so many unimportant issues? How come Christians can have contradictory opinions and still claim that they are being faithful to scripture? I suggest that it's because it's not actually about scriptural authority, but scriptural interpretation. So let's start by considering the difference between scriptural authority and scriptural interpretation. Authority has to do with rank or, or status or position. Where does scripture rank for us? What position does it hold? So as Christians, it should rank first. It should be the most important book. That, I think, is what authority means. Fair enough. But is that enough? 
Now, the issue of interpretation is to do with application. How do you take this book and apply it to everyday life? That's the distinction. And that's super important. And it's that kind of thinking that each one of us needs to do constantly as we read the Bible or as we hear it read in church. How do I interpret this text? How do I apply it to everyday life? That's so much more significant than authority. When we read the Bible, we'll all, with all of the voices that make up scripture, prophets, poets, disciples, apostles, whose is the ultimate voice that we are to listen to? Who has the final word? For me, the final word, the greatest voice, is the message of Jesus Christ. It supersedes all else. But here's the thing. In the world of the church today, I mean the worldwide church, with all of its many denominations, traditions, languages, and cultures, the issue of scriptural authority has become a dividing one. With some churches, some Christians declaring that they are Bible believing and perhaps implying that others are not. That's not true, of course. It's just that some Christians would prefer to pay more attention to the words of Jesus than the words of the Bible. The word rather than the words. And I'm one of those people. Some Christians say when referring to the Bible, God says it, I believe it, that does it. I've seen it on bumper stickers in America. It suggests, and some people actually believe this, that somehow God dictated every word in the Bible and that we are to believe every word in the Bible as literally true. Personally, I cannot think of anything more unhelpful. Let's think about this. In the Old Testament, it says, don't eat lobster, don't eat shrimp or oysters. So I hope you haven't done that. It says, don't wear clothing of more than one material. So you better check the labels in what you're wearing. It says, if your obstinate teenage son refuses to obey you, take him outside of the city gates and stone him to death. The Old Testament says all kinds of things. It says if a woman is on her period, she herself is unclean and everything she touches is unclean. It's in there. Is that the authority that we submit to? Oh, you might say, that's the Old Testament. The New Testament is different. But in the New Testament, it says women are supposed to keep silent in church. Perhaps I'd better shut up now. The New Testament says women are not to wear gold or pearls or any kind of costly attire. So all you women, you just take care what, you've, what you put on. And has any other women here ever preached or read the Bible or taught? Scripture is clear because of the culture of the time it subjugates women to a place of inferiority. And of course, scripture also legitimizes slavery. So what are we to do with this? Do we take all the words in scripture as our final authority? Because there are passages of scripture that basically make God look vindictive and, and spiteful and just pure mean. That's why we have Jesus, to give us a real picture 
of who God is, a God of compassion, of grace, of love, of mercy, of inclusion, of forgiveness. So what do we say to people who say that they are Bible believing, who claim that the authority of scripture means believing every unchanging word quite literally? Well, let me tell you, even Jesus got fed up with that. In Matthew 5, we read, you have heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, love your enemy. Jesus took scripture seriously, but not literally. So what do we say to people who that say that they are Bible believing, who claim that the authority of scripture means believing every unchanging word? Well, let me tell you, the disciples got fed up with that. In Acts 10, Peter has a vision that unclean animals are no longer unclean. That's often understood to mean that all things are now clean for food. But actually, the text has nothing to do with food and everything to do with the inclusion of non-Jews, of Gentiles, into the faith community. Peter took scripture seriously, but not literally. And again, I ask, what do we say to people who say that they are Bible believing, who claim that the authority of scripture means believing every unchanging word? Well, let me tell you, the early church got fed up with that. The Jewish leaders got together at the Council of Jerusalem in around AD 50. We can read about this in Acts chapter 15. They had all sorts of people wanting to be part of the church who weren't circumcised. But scripture was clear on the matter. All males had to be circumcised. And so the Jewish leader said, you know what? Circumcision doesn't matter anymore. For a good Jew, it was still important. But for everyone else, it didn't matter. And that was a seismic shift for the early church. The early church took scripture seriously, but not literally. The notion that we can't touch God's word and that it can never be changed is not scripturally accurate. It's not historically accurate. And it's not accurate when it comes to Jesus Christ. So in today's world, where so often the test of faith seems to be whether or not you believe the Bible literally, because if you don't, then somehow you are a failed Christian or a wishy-washy Christian. I want to make a stand. My authority is Jesus Christ. And when I look at him, his words and his actions, then inclusion abounds, grace abounds, love abounds. I want you to look at this image. For me, it sums up how I choose to read the Bible. It says, let us use love to interpret scripture, not scripture to interpret love. So I say, let us grow up. Let us take scripture seriously, but not literally. And that's what I'm passionate about. That's what has guided me in the nine years that I have ministered among you. It's in part what I believe has led us to register recently to conduct same-sex marriages. And if there's nothing else that you remember about what I've said while I've been here, please remember that. Because the way that we read the Bible, the way that we interpret the Bible, affects how we act in the world, how we relate 
to people around us. And it's why those beautiful words from John's letter are one of my guiding texts. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. May it be so. Amen. And I've chosen our next hymn because of the words that we shall sing in verse one. Kindle a flame of sacred love on the mean altar of my heart. Number 564. to share with you something of my theology of the Bible. As you can tell, I hope that it's something that I'm passionate about. But now for something a little bit more light-hearted, as I seek to share and leave with you something more of myself. And it's why I brought Wookie along with me this morning. He is a sermon illustration. Um, but I'm going to put him down because it's a bit difficult to preach and hold a dog at the same time. <laughs> now, you might say to me that there's nothing in the Bible about dogs. And to be honest, you're right. There's only one verse about dogs in the Bible, and that's from Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 11 which reads, as a dog returns to its vomit, so fools repeat their folly. 
not a lot of help there. But despite that, since having a dog, I have reflected a lot on what dogs can teach us about God. So here's my theology of dogs. Dogs teach us about love and faithfulness. That's, it's uncomplicated. Dogs will always love you and will always be faithful. If I've been gone for five minutes or three hours or away on holiday, when I return, Wookie goes bonkers with joy. And it seems to me that a dog's love resembles God's love. It's unconditional. It's always there, however far or wide we stray from God. Remember that parable of the prodigal son? A dog's love is like that. Secondly, dogs are pack animals. We've discovered this thing about Wookie, Jeff and I. If we go out for a walk together with Wookie and then part company, perhaps for one of us to run an errand and the other one to go off home, well, it's pretty much impossible because as we part, the one who has Wookie on the lead can't go anywhere because Wookie first sits and refuses to move. And when you try to pull him, he lays down on the floor, refusing to walk anywhere. He needs his pack to be together. He doesn't like it when his pack divides. I think that's a bit like humans. We are not meant to be alone. We are created to live in community with others and with God. It's one of the reasons that we worship together rather than just on our own. Being part of this church community is important. Whether you join and meet in person or on Zoom or watch later on YouTube, you, each one of you, is an important part of this church community because being in community, being in a pack is so important. And lastly, dog is God spelt backwards. Is that a coincidence? Well, I think not. When we return to God after being gone for whatever reason, God is happy to welcome us back, just like dogs. God loves us unconditionally, just like dogs. God loves us for who we are just like dogs. And I say God's presence in our lives calms us down and brings us joy and peace, just like dogs. Or as that first letter of John says, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God, and knows God. So that was my theology of the Bible and my theology of dogs, and now my theology of chocolate. As everyone here knows, I'm a chocoholic. But once again, there isn't really anything in the Bible about chocolate. Sadly, there's no evidence that Jesus ate chocolate. I am the bread of life, he said, not I am the chocolate of life. At the Last Supper, it was a loaf of bread that he broke, not a bar of chocolate. At the feeding of the 5,000, there was only bread and fish, sadly, no chocolate. So there's nothing in the Bible about chocolate. Or oh, wait. Maybe there is. 
in Proverbs again, this time chapter 25 and verse 16. If you were to look in your pew Bibles, in most translations of the Bible, you will read something like this. If you find honey, eat just enough, too much of it, and you will vomit. There seems to be a bit of a vomiting <laughs> message going on here. However, I know some of you uh, know about and have, and we've certainly read from it at times, the message version of the Bible. And let me tell you how that translates Proverbs 25 and verse 16. It says, when you're given a box of candy, don't gulp it all down. Eat too much chocolate and you'll make yourself sick. Yes, that's how it's really been translated or, or paraphrased. Chocolate is in the Bible. There's something, I think, in that verse that speaks to us of self-control, which I must confess, if I'm being honest with you, although you probably already know this, I don't have much of self-control when it comes to chocolate. But self-control aside, just for a moment, did you know that the Latin name for the cocoa bean is Theobrahma cacao? And Theobrahma quite literally means food of the gods. Well, I quite agree. Chocolate is food of the gods. And let's think a little bit more outside the box, the chocolate box, of course. Very often, what do we give to people when we want to say thank you, or I'm sorry, or get well soon, or, or welcome? We give a box of chocolates. And certainly I can say that I've received more than my fair share of chocolate at various times while I've been here in Sketty. And I'm very grateful for every expression of love that this has represented. Chocolate speaks in that sense of relationship. It can be about bringing people together about expressing loving thoughts. Chocolate, though, for chocoholics like myself, does have a flip side. I do find it hard to share chocolate. I want to gorge on it all myself. So there's a challenge here in terms of my theology of chocolate. It might be made for sharing, for giving, for welcoming, for relationship, but all too often we fail, or at least all too often I fail. And such a failure of mine to share chocolate reminds me at least of all the other times that I fail to share or fail to love. And that reminds me once again of some of those words that we heard in our reading. If we love one another, God lives in us. If we love one another, God lives in us. And it's this that I want to share and leave with you above all else. I could go on more about my theology of chocolate, but I won't. What I will do, though, is to say that at the end of our service, I will have some chocolate to share. Fairly traded chocolate, of course. If you are staying for coffee, there's chocolate on each table. If you are not staying for coffee, I will have some ready for you on my way out, which I promised to try not to eat. And I'm really sorry for everybody who's joining us on Zoom. I cannot extend the chocolate that far. But I want to end by summing up my theology of the Bible, my theology of dogs, and my theology of chocolate, 
of how God can speak through each one of those things by reminding us what they have in common. Love. I will always interpret the Bible through the lens of love. Love. Dogs teach us something of the unconditional love that I see from God. Love. Chocolate. The food of the gods at its best can be used to offer loving relationships. It's well known that a minister's last sermon in a church will often ex reflect the experience that the minister has had there. And this is certainly the case for me. You have found your way into my heart and I will never forget you. I hope too that I will remain in a small part of your heart. I am grateful to God for the love that is shared here in UCS. Love between two congregations that came together. Love between long-standing members of our congregation and much newer members. Love shared between the young and the not so young. You are a loving and caring congregation. If I have been able to be a loving and caring minister, it is because you have made it easy to be so. And for all that, and for our years together, I give God thanks and glory. Amen. Our next hymn sums this up, this journey of love that we are on. May UCS always continue to be a loving, welcoming and inclusive church. Number 409, let us build a house where love can dwell.
Let us pray. God of love, you are with us in every transition and change. As we enter into this new era, we recall your deep compassion, presence and abounding love. Be with us as we move forward, rejoicing with you and supporting one another. We pray especially for John, Linda and Noel, who will be offering ministry cover for the next year. We give thanks for their immense experience and many gifts and pray that you will strengthen them in their work together. We pray for all those in positions of leadership and responsibility within UCS as they work together to lead the church in the coming year. We pray for the Methodist stationing process, that a new minister will be called to come and work with us. We pray for the churches in the North Bedfordshire circuit as they prepare to welcome Jeff and myself, and especially the five churches for which I will have pastoral responsibility. We pray for all ministers and their families who are on the move this summer, that we will all know God's presence amidst the anxiety of change. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Our offering will now be received. God, all that we have, all that we are, we give to you. Amen. A new chapter is starting in all our lives, in yours, as Linda, Noel and John seek to offer ministry cover over next year's interregnum, and mine and Jeff's as we move to North Bedfordshire. 
Leaving is hard. Change is hard. But it's important that we always remember that even if there is sadness and even if there is anxiety for any or all of us as we face the unknown, that we will continue to be a people who always, in every circumstances, offer, uh, seek, who trust and praise God. And so we're going to sing our next song. It's number 42. Oh, sing to the Lord. Oh, sing God a new song. that we say at certain points in our lives are very important. They frame what is in our hearts and give expression to how we feel and what we feel. And so now, our liturgy of farewell. This is a time to give thanks. We give thanks for the times of challenge and hardship, for the times of tiredness and distress, for the times of failure and disappointment. We give thanks for the times of connection and wonder, for the times of community and healing, for the times of laughter and fun. For all that has been in these nine years of ministry, we say thank you. We, we give thanks. For all funerals led and people visited, for lives mourned and new lives and new members welcomed, for the sermons and prayers written, hymns and songs chosen, connections with news and everyday life woven together. For all communities and organizations supported, for the kingdom's work unnoticed and hard to measure. I give thanks. We, we give thanks. For cross words and unspoken grudges, for forgetting and failing, for all that is left undone and incomplete, we say sorry. I ask forgiveness and I let them go. 
we ask forgiveness and we let go. For the journeying together as faith companions, upholding, inspiring and nurturing one another, for the love, care and support offered to one another, a ministry that is shared by ordained and lay alike. I give thanks. We give thanks. This is a time to remember, to invite God's spirit, a time to celebrate, a time to shed tears, a time to notice your heart, a time to breathe deeply, a time to trust and a time to move on. Leslie, as a symbol of your leave taken from the role of minister in the United Church Sketty, will you now set down the keys of the church? I set down my keys, giving thanks for all who make this building a safe and welcoming space for all. Leslie, as a symbol of your leave taking from the role of minister in Uniting Church Getty, will you now set down the pastoral list? I set down the pastoral list, thanking God for all named on it and commending you all to one another. Jeff, as a symbol of your leave, your leave taking from all you've contributed to the life of Uniting Church Getty, will you set down now the accounts of UCS? I set down the accounts, praying that resources of this church will continue to be used as a blessing for all. I lay down my ministry in this place to begin a new stage of life and discipleship. As we move to Biggleswade in the North Bedfordshire circuit, we pray to be faithful in all God asks of us. God of our beginnings and endings, we celebrate all we have shared with Leslie and Jeff and ask your blessing to continue their journey. May the love that is in our hearts be a bond that unites us forever, wherever we may be. May the power of your presence bless this moment of our leave taking, that we ask for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. We have laughed together, cried together, prayed together and worshipped together. We have hoped together, dreamed together, worked together and eaten together. Now it is time to say goodbye. Parting is bittersweet. Memories flood our minds and our hearts. We say goodbye in gratitude and silence to God. I give you my thanks for our shared journey together and pray God's blessing on you in the future. We offer our thanks for our shared journey together and pray God's blessing on you as your ministry unfolds in a new setting. Amen. We are always, all of us, on a journey. 
Whether we, whether we stay here or not, we are all on a journey and God will be with us on that journey. This we believe and this we trust. And so we sing, we are people on a journey. blessing be ours on our road, on our journey, guiding us, cherishing us. And may God, who knows our path, encompass us with love and lead us by the hand, whatever our future may hold. And let's close by saying the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Please be seated. Our service this morning has centered on love and caring, endings and beginnings, journeying together and journeying on. And so it is with love we send Leslie and Jeff on the next step of their journey, with, of course, the vital ingredient of chocolate. <laughs> and a tune that I think has a special significance for them on many of their journeys.
Thank you, Alan. Isn't it wonderful to have an organist who will play the Vida as we leave or will play Oklahoma as we leave? Thank you, Alan. Please do join us for coffee and cake um, in the Wesley room afterwards. Thank you. Just to say that um, our first date, Jeff took me to see Oklahoma. Oh. <laughs>